Yeah, my name is uh, Artem, and uh, I will be talking about AI and AI and software testing in particular. And uh, a little bit about myself. I have uh, a degree in mathematics, and I have been in software for about 20 years, and currently I'm working on Test Trigger. You should definitely check it out. It's a wonderful startup. Anyway, let's start. So what is testing? Uh, well, the goal of QA is to make sure serious bugs won't get it into production, right? And uh, it's a very, very tough challenge uh, for AI to actually do that. And then um, <clears throat> on top of that, there is also unstable environments uh, and constantly changing code, so it's tough. Uh, and I gathered some statistics for you folks in here. And uh, like, why do people think uh, tests are unstable? And uh, all, all kinds of stuff, there is no clear winner in here. So it could be for all kind of different reasons. And uh, next, why tests are slow? Also, all kind of different reasons. There is no like precise one clear winner in here. Um, but there is always room for improvement for us. So what is solution? Definitely not that. Um, anyway, let's talk a little bit uh, about AI and uh, why, uh, why talk about AI in general. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, well, we're kind, uh, currently about uh, more than 5 million people doing uh, software QA and more than 18 million people doing software development. And software developers also spend time on QA at least 20 or 25% or more of their time is spent on QA, sometimes much more. And uh, if you calculate how much is that in hours, it's more than 20 billion hours a year in software QA every year this is how much we together spend on testing things. Can you imagine? OK. Uh, so how does human brain work and uh, why it is uh, a quite tough for modern AI to catch up? Um, well, like as you all know, there are a little, some neurons in our brain. Right, they're interconnected. So there are 100 billion neurons, uh, and each neuron can have, I don't know, 10 connections, let's say. So we're talking about a trillion connections. It's far, far, far beyond uh, modern capacities of modern hardware, on one hand. And on another hand, uh, I don't believe we actually know how our brain works. So there, is, uh, there are some theories about neurons, how they work. There are some mathematical models. Do they actually represent how does it work? Partially. All right. A little bit about terminology uh, in computer science, right? So there is, it's, it's kind of confusing currently. Um, uh, first, what is AI and what is artificial intelligence and what is machine learning and what's the difference between those, right? Well, uh, artificial intelligence as a uh, subject in computer science started long, long time ago uh, in the 50s, I believe, and uh, it has a lot of different branches. So basically, AI, if you check out the definition, it is making computers seem like uh, humans performing certain tasks. So in particular, it's a very broad definition. In particular, that means that you can program something. As soon as it, it kind of looks like human could do that, that's already AI. It's a little bit too broad. So machine learning is 
Again, quite broad, but a little bit more specific. Machine learning uh, is uh, using, instead of people telling exactly what machine should do, uh, machine learns automatically based on data and constructs behavior based on data itself and then applies that models uh, to be able to do something. So like, the best examples probably uh, being neural networks. All right. And uh, uh, like there are some examples of uh, like what kind of stuff is used in AI and machine learning in particular, like and uh, different uh, different approaches have its own pluses and minuses and then used in different use cases. Like there are neural networks and there are a lot of kinds of neural networks. Uh, Markov chains, decision tree is probably one of the oldest uh, branch in AI. Um, and uh, well, there is still no uh, serial bullet on that. It still have, everyone has issues. So oh, um, imagine humans, uh, if you uh, see some, even like not even humans, even animals, if they uh, come by something interesting and that have been already recorded as being a fact, then they can remember that and change their behavior based on just one instance. Uh, currently, if you want to uh, train a neural network, which supposedly represents a brain, uh, you would need like tens of thousands uh, of training samples just to make it do something, and that's if you're very lucky. Uh, usually, it's much more than that. Uh, Markov chains, again, like very limited. They limited by definition because they just take into account only previous state uh, when they uh, consider stas status. And decision trees are just not really working for more generic stuff like image recognition and so on. It's too slow and uh, up to a point it's unusable. All right, so that's like not very happy state of AI currently. And uh, again, uh, like just to point that there is still a huge gap and a huge difference between how brain works, even, even animal brains, and uh, what we can do with uh, all branches in artificial intelligence and computer science. So all uh, techniques which we have right now is not there yet, unfortunately. All right, so however, like we already have something uh, which is already good enough to do a lot of things and uh, help us uh, to, to be more efficient in our job, right? It's a next step, As the first step was uh, automation where people started to write code to automate QA tasks. This is the next step where we st start to use machine learning models uh, to automate even more. And uh, what, what we can do with uh, AI and machine learning is, uh, I would be usually referring to machine learning going forward, even if, if I say AI, uh, to avoid confusion. And uh, examples would be identify subsets to test, of tests to run. Let's say you have like, I don't know, millions of automated tests and there are some changes uh, supposedly, there are some ways to figure out which which to run, which one to run. Then, uh, human um, <coughs> processing of human language, like it's completely different branch, but still uh, can be very helpful to simplify interactions between humans and machines. And then, uh, making testing more stable, regardless. Uh, of HTML, XML structure changes. So imagine if you are writing tests and uh, how usually people would approach finding an element. Uh, currently, 
like a lot of people just do XPath, which is probably the least stable way. Then there is IDs, but with React, it's kind of unfortunately uh, out as an option. Um, so it's uh, it's like it might be a little bit tough. So there is um, uh, there, are, there is a new selectors coming out at Selenium, where you would be able to use uh, trained machine learning models to just say, hey, please give me all buttons on the screen which are checkout button, and it will uh, basically try to recognize if there are uh, buttons which look like checkout button and then give you references to those elements uh, to work with. Um, like in general, uh, uh, using uh, machine learning, you can train a model to recognize elements on the page more stably compared to what you would do with, with code. Uh, next, um, detecting if screen looks uh, funky, uh, even if your test passes, right? Uh, that's uh, another interesting example. Uh, let's say why we cannot trust automated tests at, at this point. Partially because, okay, all tests ran, but CSS didn't load, and uh, well, your pages are still broken. So unfortunately, automation is not enough. However, uh, it's also automatable, uh, and you can train a uh, machine learning, learning model to be able to recognize if page is broken, and uh, that is something that, which is possible to do. All right, so we're getting a little bit to, to challenges uh, with uh, machine learning. So there is, like there are some smart people they taught me about Oracle problem, you probably, everyone already knows about that, I just want to repeat it, is uh, Oracle problem where you cannot guess what, uh, it's impossible to guess uh, what application is supposed to do. One, and second, it's supposed to, in certain cases, it is impossible to guess what inputs should be, right? Uh, unless you have access to both all the code and all the data in databases. And then it is white box testing, and you usually want to probably perform black box testing. Otherwise, it's not really a testing, right? Um, and, uh, well, and therefore, as even humans couldn't do that, uh, well, we as humans could guess sometimes certain things, but still it is impossible to say that, let's say, a developer just coded uh, a yet another um, uh, airport code in there which has some special features. Why, how would you guess that? It's impossible, right? And of course, machines cannot do that. Just keep in mind, whatever humans cannot do, machines would probably won't be able to do either, right? Because we, we, we're not, uh, if there is no way to do certain things, then uh, it's, it's impossible to do for both machines and humans. Um, and therefore, uh, what machine learning cannot help with, uh, well, like currently, there is no way to guarantee everything is great in production. Um, like there's currently at this point where still humans need to do something. Um, like although machine learning and code automation is getting there, obviously. I uh, guess some inputs uh, that is related to uh, Oracle problem in there and uh, guess all the criteria of correctness. Uh, again, even humans sometimes cannot um, guess the criteria. Uh, and uh, by the way, you, you don't have to take pictures of that. I will show you where to find these slides, and I will post them then on Meetup, so don't worry about that. Um, OK, so where are we all going? Well. 
like Gartner, uh, you probably heard about those folks, estimates that 30% of testing will be done using AI by 2020. They do use the term AI, so it's a little bit vague. What we, do they mean by that? Um, but it is what it is. Um, like, there are tools for AI already on the market and uh, uh, models for certain recognition coming up to Selenium as well. Um, I might not have time to cover that today in details, but I, we can talk offline if you'd like. Uh, but overall, like we will be, every year will be gradual improvements of what our machine learning could, could do. Then, well, uh, I believe that testing is something uh, which is probably the closest to human level artificial intelligence, right? So it's probably one of the toughest problems out there to solve. Uh, because uh, like think about it, in order to be like, what do QA people do, right? So we have a domain knowledge and knowledge of outside world and knowledge of how application works and they make sure that the application works how it's supposed to. Uh, in order for any AI to be able to do that, it's almost a uh, human level intelligence. So it's probably one of the toughest uh, challenges out there to solve. Uh, however, again, it's getting close. We'll probably never reach uh, perfect level, but getting very close. And then uh, next, you'll be able to just talk to AI uh, if it is a human. Like, what does it mean? Uh, uh, whereas a branch of um, artificial intelligence, NLP, natural language, language processing, it's gone far enough uh, that there will, might be a lot of interfaces where you would be able to express using human language what exactly do you want, not necessarily the co using code, because think about it, uh, currently then uh, like uh, you are writing automation tests using Selenium, you already telling computer what to do is just you using highly structured uh, representation. And you are as a human doing all the work into translating from human language into this highly structured, structured language on what exactly does machine need to check. So what that part will definitely will be simplified going forward. Uh, where the, like, uh, uh, we will be, there are already tools out there which do some stuff and we, we will be definitely getting better and better. And maybe even Selenium will have uh, uh, something eventually. Um, and then, uh, again, so why AI wouldn't be able to do all the job of QA is because it will never be able to guess based on Oracle problem well, uh, all the domain knowledge uh, you possess about the system. Uh, but there will be an interface as to where you will be able to teach the machine about the domain knowledge so that it will be able to cover more and more areas uh, of testing. Okay, what are the trends then? So all of you doomed, or is it there is light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, well, um, I believe that uh, a job of QA will not go away. It will be transformed significantly and will be, like everyone will be much, much more efficient compared to where we are right now. Uh, and uh, well, but it, it will be different. Uh, number one thing is uh, I believe QA will be uh, 
kind of domain knowledge experts. I have seen that in, in many organizations. Uh, like in many cases, uh, uh, people in QA organizations organization know the product much better than even product managers because we are all over like the details all of the time and that is the value and there's always be the value in that because at the end of the day uh, you should be able to say okay is that a bug or not a bug and uh, like you probably will, will be able to answer most of the time um, and then, yeah, we will be uh, with uh, AI and machine learning systems, but somebody need to be uh, able to need to work with those, right? Uh, the system itself might not be able to do much unless uh, it is trained and supervised by a human, and human possessing some knowledge what is how the system should actually work what's bug, what's not a bug, and how to get to uh, certain things, and what is the domain, right? So like training and working, uh, managing these systems would be part of the job. Uh, then we will be almost always probably things which AI or even machine learning wouldn't be able to do, or it would be like so super specific to, uh, to the domain, it just wouldn't make sense uh, uh, to do and that would still require coding uh, probably selenium or something like that and of course uh, CI CD um, everyone wants to be there uh, in a continuous deployment but not everyone is there um, and it was like I, I have hard times believing that uh, a lot of organization will make it by 2020 to C CD because there are a lot of uh, different parts in making continuous deployment work. Uh, it's not, uh, Jenkins, uh, frankly speaking, Jenkins is your friend for sure. Uh, so there will be a lot of systems uh, to integrate and uh, even AI systems will probably be triggered from Jenkins. It will be part of Jenkins or systems like that, um, not necessarily Jenkins itself, or Circle CI, or whatever. Um, and uh, it's tough to get to production, right? So there will be, like currently there are issues, even uh, companies like Google can't solve properly. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, companies like Google and Netflix uh, have system they have, um, um, uh, like we, which do with small uh, test deployments, Canary, which we, we call Canary, uh, what is this, Canary deployment or whatever, um, Canary testing. Basically what, what we're doing is that uh, we're trying to release first to a small number of users, whatever we're uh, trying to release, see if that works, see if they have uh, any spikes with issues and stuff, uh, and then like proceed with uh, with everything else. But that is in a, such a child state, uh, it's amazing. There's so much more to do there. Um, it's definitely not where you would expect it to be. Um, so there is a lot, a lot there uh, in, in CICD. Uh, you can help out if. And uh, yeah, so you can help folks to do that. Okay, looks like uh, we're ready for the demo. Before that, uh, any questions? What is the source for five plus testers versus and the initials like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the question was, uh, what is the source for 5 million testers and 18 million developers? And uh, the answer is uh, internet, of course. It doesn't, it never lies, right? <laughs> you can, I Googled it. You just Google it and this is what you, you come up with. Uh, 
I don't remember where exactly I, I've seen that. Um, more questions? The person about the testing, um, Gardner told me, right? and I was like, one of us like, 2020, do you think it's achievable? By 2020, it's very soon. Uh, you're talking about his Gardner estimations? Yes, yeah. yeah. before. After this. After this. After this. After this. After this. Oh, yeah. very good. Okay. 2020 is uh, I think he is getting more than 10 percent. Well, I think, uh, <laughs> well, uh, like you might be surprised. Uh, it's not that, uh, well, two, there are two things in here, right? So first of all, um, that would just mean that there will be tools and everybody would be using those tools. Uh, by 2020, it will be like, like everybody uses uh, use Jenkins right now or something like that. It's like, or Selenium. Uh, <coughs> it's just tools will come up faster and faster and will be more widespread, uh, one. And second, uh, they use term AI. As as I mentioned, is so vague, you can basically even put Selenium uh, under AI term in there. So I have I don't know what exactly do they mean by that, and they, they don't say in enough details. I guess only the guy who actually did the research can answer what did he actually mean by that, and how how the questions questions were structured to get his data. Um, it's uh, so it so there were two things in there, but in general, uh, what I think is um, it pretty much. If we replace uh, AI with uh, uh, actual machine learning, uh, I think it, it might be very well achievable. And let me tell you why. Uh, it's because, uh, yes, some organizations will start using those tools. But then those tools will automatically do so much more, it will just, uh, by storm, will, will get to 30%. Uh, so it might be very well uh, achievable for machine learning too. All right. Oh, more questions, sorry. So I feel like my tests are already flaky. Um, they do things like, you know, like I click on something and it doesn't do what I want it to or something like that or they just fail randomly. And I feel like with AI, a lot of it is a black box, especially with neural networks, which are all okay, or with, you know, um, so basically, if I give this AI this thing and it gives me back, I don't know how I got that result. Um, and my test fails because of it. So for example, um, I can say, hey, um, find all the checkboxes. I'm like, well, why didn't you find this checkbox? And the AI will be like, I don't know. Um, well, on the other hand, if I were like, oh, find everything that has an XPath, that has, um, that's like, you know, that looks like a checkbox, or everything that, um, like, you know, has a check, Decided or something like that, I can kind of pinpoint point of failure and account for that. So, do you kind of understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, I don't want to add another point of failure to my tests. I get it. So, uh, let's talk about uh, what it's about, like how you apply. AI. Okay, so I'm sorry. Question is um, a tests are flaky and we might not be able to necessarily trust uh, trust AI uh, to check if it's, uh, it's if it's actually broken or not. One and second, like what do we do about the fact that AI might not be able to find all my checkboxes I want to test? Um, and uh, the question is, is it's very simple. So that's this this is where you come in, right? So you the, the first time AI would try to do that you'll have to super supervise it and make sure it did get to whatever uh, it needed to. And after that, it's a perfect regression. So it's not, AI won't be like fuzzy anymore. It will be just doing exactly what it did before. Yeah, right, so. Uh, like there might be some rare use cases it would uh, use the wrong checkbox 
uh, but you'll probably find out about that pretty quickly because most probably the test will fail at the end. Because if you check the different checkbox, so probably the result somewhere will be different. Uh, and it will fail, and then uh, the system will let you know that, hey, test failed, and then you'll see, yeah, because you clicked on the wrong checkbox. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, there might be a little bit, but I believe that uh, ability to find those uh, checkboxes would be more stable in general compared to uh, to like what you could do with Selenium because uh, you try to work with XPath or something like that, it's it's just like it will break almost every time developers will, will change the structure, right? Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there is a challenge with IDs recently as well. Yeah, well, isn't Selenium like, I'm assuming that the way the AI would be given is be either using Uh, no. Well, like you, you're making some assumptions uh, here. So first of all, um, uh, like a new new software, you could use all the signals uh, in there. So like, um, uh, yeah. So we will might be like image recognition there. We might be like position of element, and uh, Selenium does give you that information. There will be like IDs, XPath, names, class names, relative position to other elements, and all these this kind of things, uh, which can be and will be used uh, by automated system. And I, I don't believe like it, it is reasonable for you personally to write all of this code just to make sure you can find that element. Right. Well, maybe it will be part of Selenium eventually, but it's not. It's not there yet. But like again, so there are two ways uh, uh, how you'll be using AI. First of all, it will be like the tools which will do most of the job for you, and this is probably what you're talking about. But there will be also uh, those additional finders in Selenium itself, which you will be using to find your elements. And then you can check, okay, so it found my checkbox. Is it the right checkbox? And if it is, then, then do something. So like, yeah, it's just improvements in some gradual and some more uh, advanced to the way we work. Um, I've seen this gentleman. Um, like you said, it's not fuzzy anymore, so I'm assuming it's either five or tenfold cross-validation technique. So I've done some unsupervised learning. It was both time and resource uh, extension. So how, as opposed to what we have right now, how is that different from uh, the machine learning technique or the AI technique way of testing? Uh, like okay. we're probably going to do some let's say five or ten full cross validation of the data that we're putting in, the test data or test suites or anything into the machine, right? So like, uh, we'll have to take it offline. There is uh, too much context I don't know to be able to answer this question. Uh, but the question was, uh, like, let me try to understand it properly. Uh, like we, that you used uh, machine learning and it took a lot of resources to, to train it, which is true, it's one of the issues with neural networks currently. Uh, and uh, yeah, like it works a little bit, it's not that bad at runtime, but to train it you do have a lot of, a lot of data. And again, so this is uh, part of value proposition from like uh, all those tools out there is that like they somehow were able to find the data to train the network, uh, not just uh, uh, not not just that we have a model. So it's it's about the data. It's you know, now in a world where it's all about the data. Any more questions? Okay, next part. Uh, 
uh, I'll show you an example of a uh, test trigger. And the test trigger is a system, AI system. We do use machine learning in several capacities. And I'll be able to answer some questions on, uh, on that um, in order to, uh, to test websites or mobile applications. OK. Uh, let it there. Test there. Let's test some application in here. Do it a little bit faster. And um, all right. So, oh. oops. So we will be testing with. Uh, let me increase it a little bit. This simple application, and I'll show you how, how does it work. What does tool checks, what it can do, what it cannot do, and why? Um, and uh, like in this simple application, it's just have uh, some labels in here, edit and a button. So when you enter some data in uh, input and press a button and updates the message. It's very, very simple. And uh, if you do the first run, uh, it's an explore run, it's an exploratory testing. Again, so what the system can do and what we usually don't do when we write Selenium tests is uh, just uh, common sense checks, right? Did CSS load it? Did all images load? Did JavaScript load? Does JavaScript have any errors? Um, like these simple things. And on top of that, uh, like we will have <coughs> machine learning trained model to detect if your page actually looks broken. Again, like yes, there is a little bit of fuzziness in there, uh, but it, it will be, if it's certain that it is broken, that the probability of it being broken will be very, very high. Um, and uh, it used crawler, again, so another uh, example of different type of machine learning, not using neural networks. It's more like um, uh, closer to Markov chains uh, in here, is uh, detecting of how the application work based on uh, different inputs and different pages. And again, the system detected that there is an input and a button, and here it didn't enter anything, press the button, and here it, uh, it tried to enter something and press the button. So it generated two test cases in here. And uh, let's see if it will be able to, uh, to find the bug. I'll kick off a retest and I'll show you what the bug is. So the application looks exactly the same. But if you enter something in here, and I press the button, oops, nothing changes. Uh, that's a bug. It's a, like classical regression issue. And uh, let's see if the system will be able to catch that. And bam, it did. It says, hey, like we used to be able to find this text on the page, and uh, we cannot do that anymore. So it used to be like that, and now it is like this. So this test case failed. However, uh, if we don't enter anything and press the button, then everything succeeds. Everything works. So that's an example where a system was able to learn about uh, your website, automatically construct some tests, uh, and like that's uh, it's just a different example of machine learning. It's not neural networks. Um, and then execute those tests to, you know, to tell you, hey, like something changed. And you, it is probably an issue, although you can, it doesn't know. So you have to tell her that, no, it's not an issue. It's a feature right now. Um, OK, and that's all for, for this small demo. Let's get back to our presentation.
Thank you for listening. And uh, like this is this URL here is uh, where slides are, and I used uh, Google Slides, I think it's called. So it's all online. You can uh, you can get in there. It's very easy to remember. Bit dot ly slash ai dash in dash qa but i'll post it on uh, on the page for selenium meetup group and uh drinking time we still have some drinks <laughs> and any more questions before before we get um wasted in here <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, there is a one month free trial. That's it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Let's let. So the the application just explore all HTML and JavaScript takes buttons in. There is a complex page uh, navigation through all pages. If you take that, it will automatically uh, train itself and save the profile to your account. That's a little question of the product because it's really nice. Uh, so, like, the question is, to my understanding, would uh, test trigger be able to work with complex applications like single page applications, for example. Uh, yeah, it was actually designed for to work with simple single page applications. Uh, it does not use URL even as a signal to uh, compare pages. It's just all based on the content on the page. Um, yeah. So I'm guessing it's stringent upon your previous test of that same uh, class or same field that you're testing. So what if you introduce a new feature and you want to test that? Uh, like it will automatically, every time it runs, it detects new elements which it didn't know about before. And if you introduce a new button, it will click on that new button automatically. Again, so what it might not guess is uh, some certain inputs, because again, Oracle problem, right? Uh, and uh, that there is an easy way to, to tell it to use certain inputs like by default or in specific cases where there are two ways to do it. What about scenario-based test cases? Uh, scenario-based test cases. Like what to, like, you have to select this and select that, go to the yeah. page, and do, like, based on this action, you need to do some stupid things. How to do that? Uh, great question. This feature is coming up. But currently, uh, you can use search to see if the system was actually able already to find that test case, already generate that test case or not. And again, I'm not sure if I uh, repeated the question, but the question was, um, is there a way to, uh, to use predefined test cases uh, in test trigger? Um, someone else, yes. So the question is, uh, how does test trigger decide on what input to use? Uh, good questions. S question, uh, um, there are about 50 defaults based on type of the field. So if there are, uh, if there are signals that this field represents a uh, credit card number, like by the field itself or some labels around it, or anything like that, then it will substitute uh, most commonly used uh, uh, test credit card number, like which, which is that four and all zeros and one in the end, I believe. Um, uh, and there are 50, it, we support 50 different fields for defaults. It's just in that example which I used. This was a generic field, and therefore we substituted generic input. Uh, did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Great. Is there a way that you can configure the scenario like that? You actually have 
Uh, yeah, you, you can. For example, can... we have text box, okay? For the, the text box, uh, predefined test cases will be configured. Means what are the validations you need to do? We will be configuring, right, by default? Uh, so yes. How, for example, I have a text box as well, right? How A is it the, uh, is how A is recognizing these, uh, these are the test cases I need to generate, I need to validate. Is there somewhere you will be configuring saying that if it is a test box, these are the validations we need to do. Okay, got it. So the question is, uh, is there a way to configure uh, custom validations based on certain uh, specific controls? Uh, uh, currently, uh, like you can only uh, fine-tune validations generically for the whole uh, test, test run for all tests. Uh, and make it to check certain things or not check certain things. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, it's like one of the number one features which is coming up that you will be able to specify uh, validations f f in these specific use cases. Test, latest modifications in areas I need to add and I want to validate it. That's why I'm asking that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, more questions? Uh, does it support navigation? Like if there are hundreds of navigations in the site? And uh, my second so question is uh, what about if there is LQA, like localization in water? And what, what exactly is the concern with this localization? Uh, does that also keep that in account when one site can be navigated from different locales? Yeah, okay, I got it. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, can this trigger go for navigation? And second question is, can it take uh, different languages into account? So uh, and answer is yes in both cases. So navigation is just, uh, again, uh, like certain things you can click on and menus and so on. It's a basic uh, construct which you would work with as a human, right? So therefore, it's, uh, the system also can work with it, obviously. And then uh, uh, regarding different languages, yes. And even more, you can uh, specify you, you can build s several uh, runs separately and provide custom cookies for every run if you want to force it to work in certain language and then just retest it in, in certain language separately. Or uh, you can start from a different page or where a lot of other different ways you can, uh, you can force it to just stay in, in a certain state. So definitely, yes. Test trigger uses Selenium driver behind the scene in some combination. So the question is, does test trigger use Selenium driver behind the scene? Yes, it does. I saw in your demo that there was uh, an estimate for how long it would take to train without one day. I was curious, is there any way to guide or coach that process? Um, to help it discover the, the cases quicker, or the ones that you might be more interested in? Uh, so the question is, uh, like the estimation which was given that it will take about one day to discover all test cases, is there a way to anyhow speed it up? Did I guess right? Uh, yeah, so uh, the estimation uh, currently is uh, kind of a generic average then the system starts to discover the application. It have no idea how much time it will take it to discover all, all the test cases. So it's just impossible to predict. So it's just like an average, but as you have seen, it took way less time. And uh, eventually it will be uh, very quick, and average would, uh, will, will shrink to about 15 minutes. 
with uh, more sophisticated parallelization, which is another issue on all its own. Um, but so there hopefully will be no need uh, to, to anyhow like do anything to speed it up. It will just uh, be able to do that faster. Although, uh, again, parallelization is, uh, might be a challenge in certain cases because if you like adding and deleting something at the same time, depending on what comes first, uh, like you'll get different results. So uh, the way to deal with it is to provide different uh, user accounts for all parallel tests. If you specify, let's say, 100 user accounts, then we will run it in 100 test cases in parallel and won't parallelize more than that. So that, that addresses partially the issue. Uh, uh, but if you provide enough accounts and your system would support running that many accounts on your test environment in parallel, because it's more like DDoSing your test environment, uh, then yeah, it, it definitely will be much faster just by default. And this is the way you'll be able to speed it up eventually, then you just give it more accounts. Um, question? Is there a way to limit the scope of test trigger? So say, for example, I don't want it to go over <coughs> Is there a way to limit the scope what uh, test trigger that? Yeah, of course. So you can say, hey, uh, don't go, don't press this button. And again, you can use any of the signals we use to detect the button, in particular, like uh, text on the button, ID of the button, or anything else. Uh, and it won't just won't click on it. Or it won't use an element or whatever. So definitely, yes. Because otherwise, and moreover, you might if you do these tests in production, you might want to ignore certain things intentionally, like advertisement, for example, which is probably always different. Uh, next question. So we already have, for an example, 1,700 test cases. Is there a way to stop going to your website doing all these things? I call a routine or something so that it trains automatically while the automation runs. Uh, so the question, I believe, is we already have uh, 100 test cases. Like, do you mean automated test cases? Yeah, automated test cases. Is it possible to use that data to train uh, to train the system? The currently, no, but it's an interesting idea. Like, let, let's talk offline about that it. It reduces a lot of time for training all those things. Right? Yes. You can build on top of it. Yeah. Uh, currently, uh, there is no such feature. Let's, let's discuss it offline. So what are the limitations of the test trigger currently? What are? The limitations. Oh, what are limitations of test trigger? Yeah. Um, well. Uh, it is uh, just an uh, automated system which uh, which does uh, use some uh, like certain amount of like machine learning and guessing uh, to be able to find out what to do on your pages. So you would probably want to provide it a, a proper data and make sure it got to the places you want it to go because there might be a possibility it just didn't go whatever you would expect it to uh, because it just did not prioritize that kind, that kind of scenario high enough to uh, before the limit when it hits the limit on uh, how much it would do by default. So that, that's a limitation. And again, like any automated systems would, would have these limitations. Next question. So, uh, Similar to the limitations in space, uh, this is curious, uh, can it actually help uh, test KBI or uh, database? Uh, can no, you are. So can it uh, can test trigger uh, test APIs or databases? Answer is no, uh, because it's a UI testing system. The way it figures out what to do is based on the UI. Because you would have a button uh, in the UI, it would know to click on it. We did look into uh, similar things with API, but 
It was possible when people were using soap with the rest, there is no, no such thing. Nobody uses uh, VADL, so there is no way to automatically discover the functionality of an API. So and therefore, there is no way to automatically generate tests or uh, this way. So it will be all, all, always kind of a manual job uh, currently. And this, this is probably will be, uh, this is where you probably use of uh, Selenium or something like that is almost forever will be, will be the case. Um, Uh, so the question is, does the trigger support native iOS and Android apps? Answer is yes. Uh, test trigger does support UI for native iOS and native Android, uh, compiled for emulator and simulator. And next. Yep. Um, so let's say that it's a page that has a name Uh, good question. So the question was, uh, let's say, uh, like uh, if, if you guys deal with HTML, you know that not all buttons are buttons or uh, A tags. So some of them is just like a text, but this text like a div or span or something like that uh, could have an on-click event. And can test trigger recognize that? The answer is in most of the cases, yes. So uh, like we will look into on-click event, and we will look uh, into other signals. In particular, does this thing even look like a button? Um, yeah, I, I have a second question. So we said, for instance, that I have an image, um, I have an image, I have an input. I convert some text, and then add the text on the image. But then on the first version, it was going to an image on the text on the top. Um, also, the second version is like coding a web service and it's returning like the image with the text inside. Is your solution like get a error of saying, oh, okay, so it's the same feature, so instead of like adding two elements, one is the image and one is the text on top of the image, now it's only one image but it's like right, the same output, or is it like made of I have hard times understanding. You probably want to show me an example or something like that. Yeah. Sure. Um, like, do you mean like if uh, an element would be uh, severely changed or? Yeah. So if the if the layout of the page, basically the feature is kind of the same, but if the element that composes the page is not the same. I'm not following. Like, so uh, basically, a uh, question is something like uh, if if elements input elements would change, uh, like will be in different places in HTML, yeah. will convert into different things uh, completely, and uh, would the system be able to recognize those and match those? And uh, the answer is in most of the cases, yes, because it uses about twenty different signals to find elements and it works with sets of elements on the page instead of trying to find exactly the same thing again. Uh, this, is a, this is how it is different from how you would write a Selenium test. In a Selenium test, you would try to find the same element. Uh, because the system is uh, completely autonomous, it doesn't do that. It just finds all the objects on the screen and then uh, tries to match everything it was doing before, the F, how, how it could work now. And it would go with best guess unless it wouldn't be able to, to match at all or uh, signal strength wouldn't be high enough. Any more questions? Yes, just last one. No. <coughs> so uh, is anybody uh, using it with their production system? this moment.
Uh, the question is, do, does anyone use it for production system? Uh, well, like it's, there are two things in that. Yes, like uh, we do have paying customers which use this system for both test and production, and they use it uh, in test to do like these full tests with end-to-end -end scenarios, where we can go all the way through because it's a test data, test credit cards, test SSNs, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but in production, you obviously can't do that because you would need some real SSNs, real credit cards and stuff. Uh, it's just uh, you won't go through. Uh, and, but in that case, they use our system as a uh, smoke test that just basic things work, right? Like uh, images loaded, CSS loaded, JavaScript doesn't have errors. And uh, like if we will also check that the pages would, uh, would render properly. Just more basic checks. So the question is, the answer is yes, but you wouldn't be able to do everything. So the question is like, uh, what are the challenges like and limitations uh, we've heard of? What, what your and customer yes, and uh, uh, well, like we do have uh, feedback, like uh, like this gentleman provided uh, about uh, uh, or lady provided uh, that like we should there should be easier way to let the system know. Uh, how how to go for certain cases, and uh, we're just working on it. There will be such a feature, and that's it. So again, so like uh, the goal of Test Trigger as a company is to make sure it simplifies the life of uh, QA people, not make it harder. Right. It's not about the tool; it's about the value. <laughs> so yeah, so if something is not there, it will get there a little later. Uh, more questions? All right, I guess this is it. Sorry for holding you a little bit longer here, but I believe there is uh, still some <laughs> drinks. And I would like to say thank you to South Labs for hosting this event. South Labs, awesome. Thank you, South Labs.